Hi, my name is Ronnie Nell, and this is episode three of Artists, Makers, and Neighbors. In the previous episode, we talked about the history of DDAA and how we've grown throughout the 21st century. In this episode, we'll explore how sustainability plays a part in the artistic practices of our creative community members, establishing a lasting impact on those touched by their work. Whether sustainability is through material recycling, cultural preservation, or conservation of conversation, it is an invaluable tool in the practice of art making. I just want to start off, uh, if you could introduce yourself and kind of explain what you do. Okay. Yeah, sure. So my name is Gigi McGraw and um, my artist name and brand name is She's Gigi. And I was trained as an actor and I have a master's degree in theater, but I would say my concentration um, is as a social practice artist with focus on what I would call didactic performative presentation and um, also uh, emphasis on uh, cultural preservation of hyper-local histories, which basically means I exist in um, the different expressive arts. And as so, I also consider myself a maker. So I'm a, a maker is a person who makes like creative objects or experiences. And as a social practice artist, I um, also pretty much, uh, it's a medium, it's an art medium that is geared towards human engagement through social interaction. So it's also been known as dialogical uh, art or participatory art. And so I use that art form to create plays, stories, projects, experiences that seek to share or gather uh, historical knowledge, um, primarily but not exclusively, about the place where I reside, mm -hmm. which is this 235-year-old Keystone State, Pennsylvania, um, with a white hot emphasis on the city of Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. So you kind of are a part of Da Vinci now, in a way, and I was wondering how you got involved with DBAA and how you became aware of Da Vinci. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'm glad that I'm a Da Vinci friend right now. Yeah. That's what I call myself. <laughs> uh, so I actually found out uh, about Da Vinci Art Alliance through Sammy Kovnat. Uh, I We met at a Monument uh, Lab event, and she was basically telling me that she was part of the programming committee for the Everyday's Future Festival. And she said that the theme, based on what we had discussed about the type of uh, art that I do, social practice, the theme was around sustainability, but sustainability through every lens. Mm. And typically when we think of sustainability, at least for me, you think about something that's lasting for a long time or something that you want to preserve and make sure that's not damaged. And so typically we think of green spaces, we think of landscapes and buildings, but I wanted to uh, focus on sustainability of the, those things that are not tangible, um, like the uh, story of the street corner store that you know was there for 60 years, or of um, trends and rituals of bygone eras, those hyper-local stories of communities and people and places that once were, and if we don't preserve those stories, they could be lost forever. What motivates you to encourage writing in others? And why do you feel like it's an important practice to have? I would say that there are two reasons that motivate me to, to help others. One is that I come from a family that there were not many artists in, in it. In my school also the teachers were not very supportive. I had very few teachers that were supportive of, about the creative side of myself. Mm -hmm. And I realized that like when I help others, it's a way of me trying to there's this phrase that is very, very cheesy from Baden Powell, the founder of the Boy Scouts, that says, leave the world in better conditions than you find it, right? Mm -hmm. So even the, the phrase is very, very cheesy, I like it, and that's, I feel like that, that's what I'm trying to do. I am trying to do something for others that I didn't have. The second is to feel that now uh, my understanding of writing has changed a lot. Like before it was very like centered in the person, in the individual, now I think more collectively, and now I think that by them writing, it's also me writing. I'm not me, Carlos, but a me that it's us at the same time. So I am trying to now erase the, the, the borders between what is the individual and what is the collective, and realizing that 
when I read them, their poems or their stories or whatever, it's also something of me there. So what brought you to writing? How did you find that as an art form? And what, like, how did you connect with it? Well, I always tell this story about finding a poem that my mom wrote. But also I think that it was a way for me to... When I started writing, in, like, let's say in high school, I had some... some feelings or some ideas that I couldn't express verbally, like orally. Mm. Unless I was able to write something that would be kind of like what we call now poetic, but I didn't think that it was poetic at the time. It was something that didn't make sense in the direct language that we use every day, right? Like to name things or to, to relate with reality in a direct way. It was, I was using a lot of indirect language, a lot of, yeah, figurative language to refer to things that I was feeling, to emotions that I had. So it was a way of expression. I think that the very first um, trigger of my work was expressing myself. And I still do. Like sometimes when I feel very overwhelmed by what it's around me, I do go back to my writing to kind of like find that. The yeah. essence. Kind yeah, of yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, like almost as a sorting your brain type mm -hmm. of thing. Exactly. And also then when I realized about how some people would feel connected to that, that's when I start taking it more seriously and yeah. say, okay, now this this is, again, this is not about me, it's about the work. And you started with poetry and then kind of moved into more fiction writing and eventually into non-fiction? Mm. I don't think so. Like, I, I have never considered generous be something that I commit to. Like, I I struggle a lot. When I, when I came to the U.S. to study my MFA, Everybody was talking about like, oh, what genre do you write? And I was like, I don't really know. Like I write whatever, I, like in the form that comes to my mind and the mind doesn't have these separations of what it's what. Mm. Um, some of my poems are very like, they do have kind of like a history. Some of them they don't. My, I would say that my prose is very poetical if that's something. <laughs> now they are talking about like poetical prose, but I just feel that the, when it's artificial, it's when we create these limits between mm -hmm. like, oh, the all Because in, in other latitudes, there is no such thing of the division between right. narrative and poetry or theater or whatever. Like, it's just expression. Yeah, it's interesting with writing how like people feel more comfortable kind of putting something into like a category. Mm -hmm. Whereas with like kind of more visual art forms, it's you can jump back and forth a lot of the time and yeah. people don't really think anything of it. Not right. So I think writing is that way because exactly the, the writing way of thinking, the rational way of thinking that divides words and divides sentences and divides paragraphs have made us very strict with the thought. But in oral cultures, for example, I lived in Tanzania for a while mm -hmm. or in Mexico that I, that I come from. The, the orality allows us to kind of like bend or to, to, how do I say, like to, manipulate, to, yeah, no, like, like, like to, to mix the limits, there, there are no limits in orality, you can be talking with someone for hours and you don't really understand where the paragraph was, right, right, like, <laughs> because the ideas are just like one after another, they are like all um, entangled, mm. totally. but with, with the grinding way of thinking that it's also very western, it's like this, and then this, and then that. Yeah. But actually our thought doesn't work that way. Our thought is just connecting like a continuous... I mean, they use the, the train of thought. I don't think that it's a, it's a train, it's a, like a river. Where the river starts, where the river ends, like, I don't know. Through your art practice, you use a lot of kind of natural found items. Right. How do you come across those items and how do you, and why do you incorporate them in your art? The reason I started my felted stones is um, my oldest son died six years ago and we were all devastated. We were a close knit family and it completely devastated us. And in Judaism, we place a stone 
like a rock on the headstone of our loved one. And that shows them that we're there, but it also um, holds the heaviness in our heart and, and that's what it represents. So when my son died and we put a plaque where some of his ashes were, I didn't want to just put a plain stone. He was a really colorful, unique, out of the box kind of guy that everybody loved. And I wanted something to represent his personality. So I felted stones in all different bright colors. And when my family had this memorial service, we all laid down those felted stones. And that was the beginning of felted stones for me. But then it kind of grew and morphed and evolved into all kinds of other things. So I started doing grief vessels because I kind of say that your grief is held in all these nooks and crannies. Mm. And so the vessels kind of represent that part of my story. But then I just got joyous with it. I just started doing all these beautiful landscapes and garments and jewelry and you could do so many things. And then the pandemic hit. So in May of 2020, we had the pandemic, businesses were shut down. Um, then we had the George Floyd killing and we started to see all this looting and rioting. And then we had the National Guard in the city. It felt like a war zone to me. Yeah. And then the tornado hit. Like, right. I don't know when Philly has ever had a tornado. <laughs> I cannot remember a time. And so I would walk around the city with my dogs because you couldn't get close to anybody. So we were taking really long walks with the dogs. And the tornado left all these giant branches. And since the infrastructure of the city was not working, so the branches were there for a month, I started to think about sticks and stones and my felting and I thought sticks and stones will break your bones but words will never hurt you and that's just completely wrong because yeah. we were seeing in first person how words were really hurting everybody so I started collecting branches much to this dismay of my husband who was <laughs> very tolerant of my weird art stuff <laughs> and I started felting the branches and I was incorporating stones and uh, out of that I was fortunate to have a solo exhibit called Sticks and Stones. The fellowship program at Da Vinci, a lot of it is like encouraging community engagement because I think that feeling of hominess and like family really stems from the fact that we do a lot of events and outreach mm -hmm. and your work is really personal. It's like about kind of your experiences, your traumas. How is that kind of reconciling the two of those things with talking about your artwork really like sharing it with the community and even doing events re related to the exhibition and still having it be super personal like what did that look like for you yeah so the other fellowships have more of like a really intense community based like interaction like my partner shows currently up right now um and he's gonna help elementary school kids pray it's really cool though because a it's an experience for him b his primary goal is to reach the local communities and the kids of philadelphia and i think he's happy to do it any way possible. Mm. Um, also, like, talking to people, like, in the news. Like, that was, like, a really big step for him. Um, and it gets that message out there. And I think that in my format was basically, like, hey, these conversations don't happen very often. This neighborhood is not, like, the one where I would see that conversation happen very often, you know, yeah. in South Philadelphia. Like, I'm not going to walk down the street and see an a, affordable housing for me. Right. Um, B, and a lot of people look like me and who are talking about being disabled and queer. And there's a lot of, like, really cool family community out here, but, like, 
they don't look like me. Yeah. And so having them have to like interact with that kind of work and hear that kind of work to me is a big step. I think it's like interrupting what we think is like the comfortable, but not trying to make you uncomfortable. Like something where you're just like, oh my God, but like where you're like, hey, this is shaking up what I know, what I didn't know, my dialogue. Also, I see this person and there's a lot of nuances to being a person of color. And I think that like sometimes people see you in one way how do we how do we look them that way? So being that kind of like basically like a diary based show, you know, in a very like abstract and like weird way was really important to me. Also the also like people coming to actually see it and like the amount of people came to see it was like devastatingly great. <laughs> and I mean that's the best way possible. Like I didn't think I'd ever have my work reach that many people. Mm-hmm. And I think that was the goal was like besides having the space to like make something that meant so much to me, like having it reach so many people. Like, I was just like, there's no way people are going to really come. And then I was, like, squeezing my way out of the door. <laughs> so I think that was really a big part of it, to, like, be, have something so personal. People want to see it, want to ask questions, want to talk about it, want to constantly see it. Um, and also people wanting to follow up with me it was really cool. You talk a, talked a little bit about how many people came through the door and got to see the show. What do you hope they took away from it? I hope that they saw how important this opportunity means to communities that might not get these opportunities often. Like, like we, we're not in the room as often as we'd like to be. Um, and then to have the freedom and like of expression in that format, I think really could make some beautiful results. So I think that like to, to, to my horn a little bit, but like, I really think that having that access and that space, like really allowed me to like make some of the things I would never thought that I was really proud of. Mm-hmm. And that I think were really successful. And I think so like seeing that like, when given the space and the opportunity and the conversation and the way to lead the conversation and also be a part of the conversation, we can create beautiful works that might not be done before, can create new conversations. Like I don't, I think, <laughs> This one, one older man came in and he like looked at the table piece and he was just like, what is this about? And I was like, oh, it's about the divide, you know, between my parents, like the, where I come from, my race, my ethnicity. And, but there is still like a dinner placement of it because I want it to be a conversation. And that period of conversation, he was like, oh, really? You know, you don't know Spanish. He was like, why? And I talked about like. I really don't know why my dad didn't raise me with that. I think he tried once or twice. I went, you know, I did the whole middle school, high school Spanish class. And my dad's like, baby, baby. And I'm just like, baby. And he's just like, no, why is it sticking? And then I was like, I hate Spanish. I'm not doing it ever again. It's because it's a kind of like math homework. You're like, I have it at home. I don't want to do it because it's like, ah. So it's like, you know, we caught a conversation about that. And he was like really interested in that. He was like, you know, I don't, I'm not going to pretend to understand exactly how he felt, you know? He was like, but it's really happy to hear this, but also, like, seeing the work is, like, even if I don't understand what it's about, mm-hmm. it's really beautiful, and it feels like something is happening here. Because, mm-hmm. you know, the placement of everything in there is, like, to be, like, a house and little fragments. So I thought that was really cool that he was just like, yeah, like, I, I see that you're doing something here. Yeah. I don't I completely want to say that I understand it. He was like, but... It's visually appealing, and I think that the conversation has been started. It's great. So, you know, it was just one of the things where I was like, all right, this is doing something. It's kind of nice.